Good evening, buenas noches, and thank you for tuning in. On behalf of all of us at the locally based, independently owned bookstore, Books and Books in Miami, Florida, and Elliott Bay Book Company in Seattle, Washington, it's my pleasure to welcome you to a virtual evening with Namwali Serpel to discuss her new novel, The Furrows, published by our friends at Hogarth Press. Namwali Serpel was born in Lusaka, Zambia, and lives in New York. She received a 2020 Wyndham Campbell Literature Prize, the 2015 Kane Prize for African Writing, and a 2011 Rona Jaffe Foundation Writers Award. Her debut novel, The Old Drift, won the Annisfield Wolf Book Award, the Arthur C. Clarke Award for Science Fiction, and the Los Angeles Times Art Seidenbaum Award for First Fiction. It was named one of the 100 notable books of 2019 by the New York Times Book Review and one of Time Magazine's 100 Must Read Books of the Year. Her nonfiction book, Stranger Faces, was a finalist for National Book Critics Circle Award for Criticism. She is currently a professor of English at Harvard. To moderate this evening's conversation, we're joined by Isaac Fitzgerald, the New York Times bestselling author of Dirtbag, Massachusetts. He appears frequently on the Today Show and is also the author of the bestselling children's book, How to Be a Pirate, as well as the co-author of Pen and Ink, Tattoos and the Stories Behind Them, and Knives and Ink, Chefs and the Stories Behind Their Tattoos. His writing has appeared in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Esquire, The Guardian, The Best American Non-Required Reading, and numerous other publications. Just a quick reminder that throughout this evening's broadcast, you can post questions below in the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of the screen, and please order your copy of The Furrows from Books and Books in Miami or Elliott Bay Book Company in Seattle. And that way, you'll be supporting your favorite neighborhood indie bookstore. And now, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Namwali to the virtual stage. She'll start off with a reading from The Furrows. Thank welcome. you. Thank you so much for having me. And thank you to everyone uh, who's come out tonight to our virtual space. I'm going to read from the beginning of the novel so I don't think you need any context. I don't want to tell you what happened. I want to tell you how it felt. When I was 12, my little brother drowned. He was seven. I was with him. I swam him to shore. His arms were wrapped around my neck from behind, his chest on my back, his knees pummeling my thighs. At first, his small, heavy head was on my shoulder, and he breathed in my ear, the occasional snort when water came in. His head bounced, my shoulder ached, his hands were knotted at my collarbone, and I held them there with my hand, both so that he wouldn't let go and so that he wouldn't choke me. With my other hand, I pushed the water away. We had gone to the beach together for the day, just the two of us, alone. This was allowed. This was our whole summer. Every morning after breakfast and cartoons, my brother and I would leave our father to edit his articles and our mother to dab at her paintings. Wayne and I would change into our still damp swimsuits and I would pack us Capri Suns and Lunchables from the fridge. We would walk, we would walk along the roads, cutting through a gap between the fancier houses to reach the beach. My mother had told us that the gap was called no man's land, which Wayne misheard and took to mean it belonged to a man named Norman. We'd sneak quietly through Norman's land, then tromp over the boardwalk, our flip-flops knocking against it, and find our favorite spot on the shore, which was marked by clumps of seagrass. Wayne was a nutty brown, a scrawny creature, a good kid. He played so hard, as if play were work, I was too old to play, so I watched him play and helped sometimes. That day, I buried him for fun's sake. We dug a shallow trench with cupped hands like dogs, like gardeners. The top sand was cane sugar, the under sand brown sugar. 
When the trench was big enough, he tumbled into it, and I packed the sand onto his body, pat patting it over his hands and over his bony knees. Under the fluorescent sun, he lay still as a magician's assistant. He asked me to cover his head with our straw hat, and I said, no, you'll suffocate. He flinched as if to grab for it himself, then remembered that his hand was buried. Too late, the mound of sand over it had sprouted a crack. He glanced at it, at me. I pat patted the sand back flat. After a moment, he said it again. He mouthed, cover my head. I touched my sandy finger to his sandy cheek. Close your eyes, Wayne, I said, and place the straw hat over his squinching face. Although our family had owned the straw hat for many years now, it was still too big for either of his kids to wear. We used it for carrying things instead, its leather chin strap serving as a handle. We had used it today to bring lunch and a towel. Now it swallowed his head completely. You're a dead Mexican, I giggled. Ole, he muffled from under the hat. I mean, cowboy, I said. Ahoy. That's a sailor. There was a pause. Yeehaw, he said. I didn't answer. I didn't laugh. I walked away from his buried body, staggered off into the sand pockets toward the greenish sea, bored, but deeply satisfied that he would be surprised to find me gone when he lifted that dumb hat off his face. My turn to trick him for once. My toes were already wet by the time he realized I was gone. He leapt up and tossed the hat and gangled his way toward me, yelling pell-mell, splumishing past me into the water. I watched his bronze back vanish, then retreated and sat beside the empty trench with my arms around my knees. There was no one else around. It was bright and hot, the end of summer. Then the clouds came and lowered. The wind rose, the waves rose. Dear Wayne, you swam into the furrows. At first, you didn't know it because you were under the surface and you faced down as you swam, staring at the vault of the sea below. Then you felt the sky darken above you, a shadow passing. And when you came up to breathe, you were suddenly inside them, the great grooves in the water, the furrows. On either side of you, those whirring sheets of water rose, the foam along their edges sharpening like teeth. On either side of you, the furs were chewing, cleaving deeper. They ate you up. You were alone out there, and the world took you in, reclaimed you into its endless folding. Thank you. No, thank you so much, and thank you so much for this beautiful, beautiful book. And I'm so glad you read from the opening because that's kind of where I wanted to start. I don't want to tell you what happened. I want to tell you how it felt. I mean, that's the opening line, but it's also not to give too much away, but it's repeated throughout the book. So I wanted to know, like, it's a line that I felt deeply. Can I ask mm. you how you discovered it? Like when you knew it was going to be your mm. opening line? When did you know you were going to use it again and again? Yeah, I mean, it, it came late. You know, there are various aspects of the book that came late. The the subtitle, the, and, uh, the furrows and elegy came late. And the decision to place those two sentences at the beginning of the novel and have them recur as a refrain also came in the revision process. And part of it was because I kept saying something like that to my early readers in trying to explain what I was trying to get at with some of the more experimental aspects of the structure of the novel. The novel repeats. It has this kind of poetic structure. It has a rhyme or a rhythm to it. And one of the things I was trying to get at with those repetitions was accessing a feeling rather than an idea. <laughs> and, you know, there's a lot of uh, different works of fiction, film, television that are interested in repetition right now. Nathan Fielder's The Rehearsal. We've got, you know, Russian Doll, Natasha Lyonne. And, you know, I think uh, even um, I, I May Destroy You, which is, I think, an incredible uh, TV series as well. And I think you have this interest in what does it mean to repeat or what does it do to us to repeat? What does it actually uh, enact for us as an audience? And I wanted to from the very start, get the reader focusing on what this was doing to them internally, 
rather than on trying to puzzle it out like it was some kind of uh, kind of cognitive game. And in a way, like making them feel what it meant to come back and back to this. So real, just real quick, just for those that haven't. Yeah, read, yeah. I want to get, yeah. But just give us a little bit for those that are just like, they're like, they're going to buy the book or they already bought it, but they haven't read it yet. Just a little touch of, of what the furrows is about. Yeah, so the furrows itself refers to these grooves in the water, but that also becomes a kind of conceit or a metaphor for the entire book where I'm trying to enact the feeling of waves of grief washing over you when you lose someone. So at the beginning of this novel, the I that I was just speaking from the perspective of is a 12 year old girl named Cassandra and she's taking care of her little brother, Wayne, who is seven and he is lost in some fashion. He is perhaps kidnapped. He is perhaps drowned uh, accidentally. He, there are versions of his loss that involve a car accident, that involve uh, a carousel at a local park. There's a sense that we're not sure exactly how Cassandra loses her little brother. And these repetitions of the loss are meant to reinscribe that sense of, you know, there are all these different ways that he could have gone. But as her father, uh, who is an African-American uh, engineering professor, um, puts it at a certain point, it doesn't matter how he's gone. He's, he's just gone. And the novel is this kind of attempt to uh, um, grapple with what is sometimes called ambiguous loss, where you lose someone, but you don't know exactly how. And you're not sure, for example, if someone committed suicide or if they were killed or if it was an accident. And in this case, it's, you know, was it an accident or, or a kidnapping? Is this child vanished uh, or is this child um, actually passed? And Cassandra's mother, who is a white female artist, um, believes that her child is just missing. And so this creates an impasse in the family as they try to reckon with whether or not this child is simply missing or, or has actually died. Uh, and this is something I, I really wanted to sort of figure out how to convey how that particular ambiguity about losing someone can manifest in all of these different psychological patterns, including what is often called a repetition compulsion. Which again, just like those waves coming back and back again and also led to like again not giving too much away but like a hell of a first act and a hell of a second act in sure. this book. but i but i wanted to start before we like not getting too deep into it but like grief is so big and yeah. so broad and to be honest, like so much is written about it. yes so what made you what made you want to tackle grief as a subject I mean, I think, you know, I, I've experienced grief myself. I've experienced mourning. I've experienced loss. I think many of us um, have. And it's it's very interesting to have written this book in the wake of, you know, personal familial losses, tragedies. I lost my sister when I was 18 and she was 22. I lost my mom in 2016 uh, when she was, you know, in her early 60s and I was in my mid-30s. And there's you know, those personal losses haunt us all the time, but I'm publishing this book in the wake of massive loss because of the pandemic. And there's in fact, you know, um, some recent work that's about this notion of ambiguous loss uh, by a psychologist, named, uh, I think Pauline Boss is her name, who's been writing about how as a culture, we can reconcile ourselves to this larger scale grief that the whole country, the whole world has experienced as, as a result of the pandemic. Um, my interest in writing about it to start wasn't just to sort of work through my own grief. I had a really interesting um, question posed to me by a good friend of mine uh, just last night at the book launch that I did here in New York. Um, he said, you know, I was, I was friends with you when you lost your sister. Would you, would young Namwali have wanted to read this novel? Would it have helped? Which is a really interesting question, right? And I had to say, I was like, I don't know if it would have. Like, mm -hmm. this book is not an attempt to uh, present a manual for dealing mm -hmm. with grief mm -hmm. or a, a kind of map of what it looks like. Um, 
But then I thought about it and I was like, you know, books that really did help me deal with my grief had a very oblique relationship to, to loss. Um, so Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse, for example, is very much a book about loss, but it's so slant. You know, the Dickens, Emily Dickinson says, tell it slant, tell the truth, but tell it slant. Wolf is clearly dealing with the loss of her mother, um, who she figures in the novel as Mrs. Ramsey. But the structure of that book is so much more about the rhythm of, of loss or the rhythm of feeling than about some kind of psychological working out of it. That a book like that, which I read as an undergraduate when I was dealing with this uh, loss of my sister, resonated with me uh, in a way that I could not have predicted uh, beforehand. And so I thought, well, maybe this book can have that kind of relation uh, for other people. It's very, it's very possible. But my aim was not to, to provide that manual per se, but really just to engage with this long tradition of the elegy in, in the literary world. And, and again, to not say what happened and definitely not say what you should do when this happens, but just how it felt, which I think, I mean, yeah. it's beautiful to hear that yeah. you thought about that so specifically because i really think you pull it off in the book mm, thank you. um so I, I i again a lot of questions here but like i want to hang out here for a second because you just in a way brought yeah, yeah. Thinking about it and a little bit of craft and your writing is front and center in this book and also of course mm. the old like you're brilliant so there yeah. are many books like i said there are many books about craft many some of them are also incredible some of them are not uh, <laughs> talk a little bit more about that craft like you obviously were being so specific about this but like how yeah. did you write this book especially you know the old drift and we'll get to that in a second but such a massive book here is yeah. a book that you wanted to make literally physically smaller yeah yeah and much more intimate I mean, it, novels come to me in uh, out of order, I should say. So I always have different ideas for books in my head that I'm sort of working on all at the same time. And so while I started The Old Drift first, I finished The Furrows first, and I published The Old Drift first, but, and I'm you know publishing The Furrows second, but I also have written, you know, two thirds of another novel. And I, I have like three or four other novels. Wait, that I'm <laughs> right, They're all happening at the same time, yeah. And so in some ways- okay, sorry, no, there's, I think there's a, there's a sense that I think a lot of people have that novels are something you sit down and dec make decisions about. And while I absolutely think that's true for nonfiction, for nonfiction memoirs or nonfiction essays, for the critical, uh, you know, work that I do, reviews and so on, my novels come to me in a much less, um, I don't know, uh, narrative, like, beginning to end way, right? I can't even say that this is technically my second novel. It feels like my first in some ways. And for me, they come almost like a, a complete vision. Mm. And I'm, I'm trying to work out what the different elements within that vision mean and how to actually put them down on paper. This is so much, it, it's almost like I'm a translator of something that I have the privilege to have access to. And I feel very much sort of beholden to what that is. And the, I've learned this over the years. For a long time, I thought I had control over my fiction. But what I've realized is that, you know, I try to change things about, you know, a character's name and the character's like, that's just, that, that's not my name. What are you doing? Or I, I decide to try to to give a character a different sexuality and they're like no I'm clearly bisexual like what are you doing or I <laughs> and in this case of in the case of the furrows I knew there was this repetition structure and part of that I, the reason I knew that is because the opening scene that I just read from came to me in a dream and one of the aspects of mourning I wanted to capture is the ways that I used to dream about my late sister and imagine her alive and then wake up to realize once again that she had died. And that feeling of grief breaking over me like a wave, which would happen, you know, it happened for years and years and years. I realized what well, the, the, this novel is gonna have that dreamlike structure for sure. At some point I tried to take out that 
repetition. I was like, oh, let me just tell a straightforward story beginning to end of what it's like to lose someone and, you know, grow up and, and so on and so forth. And it didn't work. It just didn't work. And so I ended up going back to the original conception. And I, I feel so privileged in some ways to be allowed to play with time, play with with this way in a time where, you know, there's a lot of very strong imperatives on writers to be really straightforward, you know, to, to what is your character's arc? How do they change? How do they, what, what is the takeaway? I hear that so often as a question. What is the message? What is the takeaway from this book? And so to be allowed to sort of explore the way the modernists did, the way that Faulkner did, the way that Wolf did and uh, Joyce did and, um, Ellison and you know, Hurston did is it feels like a real privilege in in this in this era. But my my real goal was always just to try to replicate as much as possible the original vision that came to me. That's incredible. Can I ask, were you was that something that happened on the room by yourself that you took it out and then you put it back in, or was there an editor that oh. was along the way that was like. Ah, but yeah, yeah. No, no. I, I, I believe that that you know when sometimes people are like, oh, editors are just interfering with your your vision and so on. I very much believe that editors are indispensable, and I feel absolutely so grateful to both my official editors, um, Alexis Washam, who first bought this book, Poppy Hampson, who was my editor for the Old Drift as well, and um, Parisa Ibrahimi, who took over the book. And uh, David Eberhoff, who is the, the publisher at, at Hogarth, for believing in, in this vision, but also helping me to try to translate what I was trying to do to readers and making slight adjustments, um, but never really impinging wholly on, on the book itself. But there's also all these informal readers. Uh, you know, earlier I was mentioning my, my good friend, Michelle Quint, our good friend, Michelle Quint, um, who's an editor. My partner read this book and granted it the the subtitle analogy so having this sense of multiple readers giving you that um that feedback of what is coming through to me and i'm responding in this way do you want me to respond in this way because if if you want me to respond in a different way we need to adjust things i think it's writing a, a novel is completely a communal act you know mm -hmm. but at the same time i think the there were moments where I had readers who were not just identifying what wasn't working, but were trying to suggest things that would work better. And some of those transformations, such as taking out the repetitions or writing the entire novel from the perspective of Cassandra, because we haven't even talked about this yet, but the novel switches to the perspective um, of a different character halfway through, would somehow make it easier for the reader. and. I think those changes, when I tried to make them, the, the vision bulked. The vision just said, no, it, that's a different book. And like, maybe I'll write that book someday, but that's a different book. And being able to find those who understood that the original vision of the book had a coherence, had an integrity, even if it's not the easiest read, um, is, is something that I feel immensely grateful for. I mean, that's wonderful. And, and again, you have those people that can help you carry that. So we, I, I have like so many back half questions. Sure, sure, sure. I feel like we're at least close enough to grief and like maybe this is yeah. me trying to, 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 to do that thing that you're just talking about, which is like, just tell me to back off. If not like if I'm trying no, to- No, no, no. About it. But like it, this book is achingly brilliant. Um, oh, and and yeah. I just said this reason, but it's, it's, and it exposes like the ways as somebody that also has experienced so much loss in my, like you mm. hold on to that loss, right? And you hold on to these missing pieces in your lives and they can, uh, to use in, but they're with you. Yes. In the lack, in the missing, in these different ways. Yes. Do you think someone can be whole after losing someone? After, like, is mm. there... Wow. Sorry. That's, no, 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 no. It's a very, it's a very, it is, it is a, it is a very deep question. I think what I will say, and I, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm probably gonna alienate a lot of people by saying this, but 
I think that my answer to that yes or no question is no. But I think that being whole is an illusion in any in any case. I mm. think part of what makes us human is that we're not whole. It's that we're partial and that we're changing. You know, there's this beautiful conception of being a human that is uh, works in the metaphor of the ship of Theseus, right? That is traveling on the ocean and for so long that every part that breaks down has to be replaced and every crew member on that ship has to pass and be replaced by someone else. And the sense that we are actually kind of constantly in transformation means that we are always open which is to and and it's it's funny because in this culture i think we ha, we we understand uh that being open is a positive thing and yet we're constantly talking about closure <laughs> we're, yeah, like achieving closure i think that that openness of possibility that remaining kind of open is actually accepting our incompleteness we're yeah. never going to be whole. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's in that acceptance that I think we can reach some kind of reconciliation, not closure, but reconciliation with the fundamental woundedness of being people who lose people. And everyone is a person who loses someone. That's absolutely right. Yeah, life is loss. Yeah. Uh, I'm so glad I asked that because that was brilliant and I got a little teary. That was oh. a. <laughs> Thank so now I'm just going to run way back into like, a, you know, the book a little bit, a little bit, but yeah. you, you said that that opening came to you in a dream. Where yeah. did you discover these characters? Was it while you were mm. writing it? Just to think about the fact that you were writing the, like all these different books at the same time. Like, yeah. you talk, like how much time did this book take? How did you discover, mm. like how did that dream then lead to the novel that we get to yeah. tell you in our yeah, something I've learned, and I was saying before, you know, the, like learning about one's process, I think, is the most important thing. I think a lot of students of writing that I teach and and work with and talk to, and even myself as a student of writing and constant student of writing, I think we think that there's a method, um, that there's a, a way to do it, but there's so many different ways to do it. And one of the things that I've learned about how I do it is that my characters essentially exist in some fashion and they kind of come to me in some fashion. And mostly what I'm doing is not inventing them, but learning about them. And so, you know, the dream that I had I was in the water with a young boy and I don't, in the dream, I don't actually remember what age I was. You know, you can be many different ages in a dream and it can switch from moment to moment. But I remember that it was a young boy. Can I ask real, just real quick, sorry. Now, now yeah, 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 yeah. Like, I'm like, where in your life, like obviously in the dream you don't know your age. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I was, I was 27 or, yeah, 27, 28. Um, so because. Cool. So the dream I had, I know I was in graduate school because I know I wrote it shortly after. So I, I, I believe I was already, I was 27. I think it was in 2008. And I, that's when I wrote this scene. And what I know is that when I, I and it's, it's funny because I, I, I was a little boy and I woke up and I wrote this, I wrote, you know, I was in the water and he was drowning and I was trying to save him. And I woke up with this feeling of great panic, but also of like so much love. And um, only in talking about the novel since it's been published have I realized it was almost for sure my nephew, Cheza, who was, uh, I mean, in 2007, uh, I said 2008, right? He would have been six or seven, yeah about that age. And so I think, you know, I was projecting the sibling relationship um, onto what is actually an auntie nephew relationship. But so much of what that dream reminded me of had to do with my relationship to my late sister that I decided in the novel that it would be a sister and her and her little brother. And learning about Cassandra, you know, or C as she goes in the novel, um, took six years, you know, I was learning about this person. I wrote the novel from 2008 to 2014 and wrote multiple drafts of it. And a very little of who she is and what she's like changed in 
um, the process of that time. And um, but she's she is she has certain similarities to me, but she's very different from me. Um, I don't think I chose to set the novel specifically in Pikesville, in Baltimore County, um, where I'm from, until later on. But she grows up in the grows up in the suburbs, and she has a black parent and a white parent, but the genders are switched for mine. Uh, she's American, whereas obviously I'm an immigrant. Um, and yeah, she has like certain, I mean, she goes to a very different school than I went to. It's, you know, and I, I just kind of learned about what she was like and, and who she was as, as I wrote the book. At some point, I realized that she was going to have what I call reunions. So earlier I referred to the losses of this little boy and she was going to have these scenes where she meets a man who seems to be her long lost brother, who she doesn't know like actually what happened to him, but she believes that she knows or felt that he died. And she meets this man who has the same name as her brother. And every time they meet and he says, I'm Wayne, the world sort of explodes around them. And at some point I realized that the second half of the novel was gonna switch to the perspective of this man that she's meeting. And that I remember very specifically, it wasn't a dream, but it, I had just woken up and I remember staring at this like shadowy patch of the wall in Berkeley where I lived when I first moved out to California. And I was like, oh, that's what's going to happen. next." <laughs> and then I had to learn about this man and I had to learn, you know, and he's not actually her brother, but I had to learn about who he was and why he was seeking her out and what was his past and what were the losses that he was going through that I was going to try to put next to hers and see if they resonated yeah and and see how they connect so again i just want to say to people i've got many more questions here but if you have a question there is the ask a question button there start to think about it start to ruminate on it maybe put some in there um but I, just getting into the back half and again i, I don't yeah. want to give too much away, but i've got like a yeah. few more of these like yeah yeah can we talk about like how to say it eloquently <laughs> Um, coitus. Uh, <laughs> you wrote bang. You listen, you wrote bang. I did. I wrote sex. I'm just, I'm just this, uh, <laughs> I am somebody that struggles with, uh, how, how did you go? Like, is that something that kind of like came easily to you? Was that mm -hmm. something? I, and it's been a minute since, you know, I've read the, but like, was that something yeah. that you had to be in the work? Like you just, yeah. you did it very well and writing sex is hard. I'm just going to say that. Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, it's funny. I, um, I very, people have asked me like, what did I struggle with in, in writing the book? And I, I, what I would say is like writing from the perspective of the man or actually men in the book, because there's another character named Will, um, who's writing from prison. Um, writing from their perspective was probably the biggest challenge for me. And I did a lot of work in, in sort of thinking through how that should manifest on the page, but also how to distinguish these two men who are in some ways doppelgangers. So they need to seem like they're the same man, but they also need to be distinct enough that you recognize that they're two men. Um, and writing the sex scenes from the male perspective was much harder than writing the sex scenes from the female perspective. Uh, not because C's sex life or Cassandra's sex life is anything like mine, because it's not. <laughs> um, you know, she has this very, uh, I think, perverse, almost um, like cross, you know, when wires cross, um, cross circuitry of missing her brother and mourning for her brother and longing for a connection with this black man that she meets. And the intimations of incest are definitely intentional and are supposed to be there and are very much sort of speaking to a long literary tradition of incest, but have no bearing on like my actual life <laughs> as a lover. You know, it's funny because there's there are sex scenes in the old drift as well. One of my favorite uh, factoids about that book is that um, the review, uh, one of the reviews of the novel in the British press was the headline was Lust in Lusaka. <laughs> Which I thought, you know, it's that just was like, the tape. I mean, 
That just speaks to how long you write the set. All right. Well, no, no, no. I, mean, I, I will take the compliment because I've heard it before and I, I, I very much appreciate it. But it, it, it was very amusing to me because I was like, I, I don't think that there's that much sex in this 576 page novel. <laughs> but clearly something about the way that I write sex was, you know, like ruffling the feathers, perhaps in a good way of this British man. Um, but what I what I really like about the, uh, you know, this, that that headline is that it the, the the sex scenes that happen in the old drift are all very different from each other and the sex the, the kind of sex that happens and I, I i read somewhere someone saying well this is a novel that's just about like a series of heterosexual um you know love affairs between various characters of different races and i was like oh you missed the whole part where there's two women in love with each other who have sex with each other and so I was like, you know, I'm, I was very interested in exploring like these different versions of desire and the different like anxieties that desire can produce in us, but also the different kinds of interest and curiosity. Like I was very interested in trying to represent what it would be like for a blind woman to encounter a penis for the first time, right? That was that was a wonderful challenge for me. I'm, I'm much more interested in the sex lives of other people. <laughs> than in representing my own. I want to enjoy my sex life. I don't want to represent it, right? <laughs> so I think in the, in the, in the furrows, it, the, the, the difficulty was trying to keep um, the pitch of desire because I knew this was a character for whom the, the reader hopefully has some investment at this point, halfway through the novel. And there's a kind of, uh, wish that we all have when an attractive character meets an attractive character, we ship them, right? So I wanted to I wanted to fulfill that expectation on the reader's part while also introducing the deep discomfort of the fact that she thinks that this is her brother, right? Mm -hmm. So cross cutting that sex scene and all of the intimations of what's happening with their bodies with her memories her childhood memories of her brother. It's very uncomfortable. I, I had readers in the margin be like, oh my God, why are you doing this? You know, this is so uncomfortable. I had an interviewer say the other day, oh, she's going there, don't go there, don't go there, because it's, it is very, it's supposed to be very uncomfortable. Um, but in some ways it was quite fun, you know, because it's, you feel like you have this, um, you know, you're drawing together these different feelings. Again, I'm so interested and how literature can make you feel things. And if that's discomfort, you know, that's that's maybe not fun for the reader, but gosh, it's an incredible thing that words on a page could could actually activate that much unsettling, you know, atmosphere. And make you feel that physically. Okay, I, again, we're going to get to question, but I'm just so excited to talk about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Just brought up a few, so I'm going to try and do these last few ones, like, quickly. But sure, like, sure. We have, we brought up the old drift you just did yourself. Like, mm. this book is very different yeah. than the old drift. It, it, and I did not realize that you'd kind of written them during same similar periods in your life. Yeah. Was that on purpose? Were you really trying to make sure they didn't bleed into to each other? Um, and then just a quick follow up on mm -hmm. that, just to, for time's sake, which is what are the ways that you think they're similar? Yeah, no, I, I, I oddly, don't have trouble with this. Um, projects don't bleed into each other. You know, one of the things that we do as writers, and I think it's a really smart thing to do. Um, I always advise my students to do this. When I when I cut things from their work, I say, you know, put everything I've cut into another document because you'll use it another day. You know, it'll it'll be something for 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 something else. There's a wonderful image for this, which is. Um, a nursery log. So a tree falls in the forest and the, it's the various saplings that grow out of the, the, the log that's lying in the ground. It's a lovely, I love that concept. And it's very much speaks to um, the sense that nothing is, nothing is ever truly lost, right? But um, when I'm conceiving a novel and for example, I, I have a, if I, if I read a book, I just read, uh, reread Plato's Symposium and I knew, I, and I was like, oh, I really want to like write a, a scene where a bunch of people are sitting around talking about their theories of love, 
you know, um, Milan Kundera wrote a short story that's based around this. And I was like, I want to try this too. I want to see what that would look like in the 21st century. And I knew exactly which novel it's going to go into. And I don't have any sense of, oh, that should have been in the in the furrows or that should have been the old drift. I know exactly where these things go. So every every everything that comes to me just knows which slot to to fall into. It knows where which which aspect of of life or experience works with within that project. So I don't actually have trouble. I didn't have trouble at all in keeping the furrows and the old drift apart. There was no, there was the closest thing is that I have a, there was a, a series of, like I, I keep a lot of notes and I obviously keep these different documents where these ideas come. And I had an image that I wanted to include in the old drift that was about the way that when you look at a map or when you're flying above the nations of Zambia, Zimbabwe and Malawi, the lakes or the rivers, when they reflect in the sun, if you're flying low enough, look me look metallic. And I, so I had this idea of like, oh, what if I referred to those lakes or rivers as like a hinge between those two countries? And I didn't get to include it in the novel, but just like riffing on it in my head, I was like, I have a whole idea for a whole other novel about Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Malawi um, that I'm, you know, sort of working on in bits and pieces as I go. So there are certain images that I think sometimes can inspire entire new projects. But I didn't have trouble keeping these two apart because they were so distinct. The only, the only thing that I would say, there are two things that I would say uh, feel to me like every writer has her preoccupations, and these are my preoccupations. And one of those is, is genre. Makes, you, you think it makes them similar? Yeah, and w one of those is genre. You know, the old drift is obviously a multi-genre work like Cloud Atlas or like A Visit from the Goon Squad, um, where my interest was really in juxtaposing different genres as different lenses on the world or on reality. And the second half of The Furrows, where I take on the perspective of this adult man that Cassandra keeps meeting, Wayne, was very interested in playing with noir, um, which sort of developed into an interest in playing with crime fiction and horror, like, like the sort of grittier version of noir. So if noir is from the perspective of the detective, I was more interested in the perspective of the criminal, right? Uh, so I was, I think in those, you know, there's a, there's definitely a sense for me that that's one of the language, image, character, plot, Genre is a really important aspect of how I write. There are some writers who write in the same genre across all their novels, but you know the situation changes, the character changes, the events change. For me, genre is something that is like a, it's a, it's a something I can apply um, mm -hmm. or want to apply to create these different effects. And one of the effects that I was trying to get in the old drift that I got through magical realism and thinking about the character of Matha Mwamba who cries constantly. And that I was trying to get at in the furrows through the notion of uh, grief as this thing that erupts is a, a longstanding obsession I have with the way that grief and sadness has within it this fiery thread of anger. And in the old drift, Matha Mwamba is also a go-go of the revolution. She's a revolutionary and the way that her, her rage comes through the fact that she's crying all the time is one way of doing it. And in the furrows, the way I was trying to access it is through the relationship between Cassandra and her mother, which has a lot of anger repressed and sometimes eruptive anger, but also in the way the world continually erupts around Cassandra when she's in this deep, uh, this deep mourning. So I, I can tell that this is an obsession of mine, that you know, trying to access the anger within grief. But I was going at it in very different directions through genre in each of the novels. I, but I love that. I'm so like it's I, it's just something I was thinking about, of course, while I was reading. And so to hear that connection like makes the world a sense to me. Again, I'm going to say everyone, we've got a couple questions in there, so I'm going to get to them. One more, but I'm being a little greedy here and then we'll do it. I'm sorry. because okay. No, 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 that's good. Yeah. But so just, you were talking about genre and like, just you, you might just be like, Isaac, you're wrong, which I'm fine with because it's yeah. noir, like it's there. And it's so yeah. fun. The question I had was like, 
do you consider like just for me the repetition the more like the scene things whatever not to give it to but like yeah. do you consider this a ghost story mm. it's you know i i taught for a lecture course as a graduate student the professor taught a course um that was on the gothic and one of the texts that was taught was Toni Morrison's Beloved, which has prominently a ghost. It starts with a ghost, essentially. It starts with a haunted house. But I remember feeling very strongly in my gut that to say Beloved is a ghost story was insufficient mm. to, to describe what it was trying to do, right? And so, and you know, there's this amazing short story by Edward P. Jones called Old Girls, Old Boys. That is told from the perspective of a man who's in prison, who has committed murder, and is both a ghost story and not a ghost story. It's like you can read it as a ghost story because there is a woman that appears to him and that appears seemingly only to him, but that whose body he ends up taking care of, that but she doesn't recognize him as somebody that he knew before she died. And so it's unclear whether it's just that he's recognized someone who's died for him in someone else, or whether that she actually is a ghost that has come back. And the, the ambiguity is never resolved, but it, it, is, it is this deep investigation of what it means to be separated from your community when you're incarcerated, to be trying to come back to your community and to have the sense both of loss in yourself and also this sense that you yourself are kind of, I have my own characters say, it's like you died and you're the ghost of the life you should have been living. Mm -hmm. That is a strong and powerful feeling of, right? And so my, my feeling about whether this story is strictly a ghost story, a story that is engaging with the logic of haunting, I think would map on to the way that Edward P. Jones, Toni Morrison, even Du Bois I am so sorry for those that are watching. I think we might have just hit the technical difficulty. Right there, Dan. I'm going to wait one moment so the memorial will come back, but I think we totally got there at the end of, of the point that we going to ask. I was just going to get to one last. Oh, here we go. I don't know what happened. I'm so sorry. You're, that, you're I, back. I, I, have, great. I have to say that. Boys, was so we're at the boys, and, and I've got one more from the audience, and then we're going to close it out. But you were at the boys. It's very, it's very uncanny that I'm talking about ghostliness and then I vanished. I, 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 <laughs> <laughs> I was like, most of the machines, things are happening. Okay, okay. So, but you're at Du Bois. Oh, I was just saying. Cool. I was just saying that um, all of these writers, um, black writers, you know, across the literary tradition that I'm engaging with, I'm engaging with like a the high modernist European tradition, but also the black modernist tradition. Um, I'm interested in the way they're using the genre of haunting uh, to tell what it's like to be a black person without necessarily falling directly into the camp of this is a ghost story. You know, the ghost, the ghostly or the haunting becomes a, a way to think about consciousness uh, rather than necessarily a way to think about reality. If that makes sense. No, that absolutely makes sense. So the one I've, we've got this question here, which, cause you had talked about uh, Virginia Woolf, but also, you yeah, yeah. Others, but this, 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 this idea of like, I do often think of like a book as in conversation with, with other books, right? And so it mm -hmm. seems like you see this book, uh, but this question is more about like what hole in the literary landscape were you trying to fill with this mm. book? Right? You have a book that's in conversation with other books, but mm. what, what was the desire in putting this book out into the world? Yeah, I think that um, We have a lot of books about grief. I think in some ways you can think of the entire like canon of literature as, as books about, 
you know, trying to reconcile yourself to loss. The elegy is a very old form. Mm -hmm. But I, I did want to think very specifically about the relationships between Black people internally, the community's debate within itself about how to mourn. Because I think that we have a paucity of language for actually grappling with how grief works in a racialized country uh, like America. And what I really wanted to think about is how different class positions, Cassandra is a very bougie, you know, suburban family, deals with grief in a very particular way. And then in the second half of the novel, we have these two young men who've basically been living on the street um, and how they think about the losses or the grief that accompanies being black in America, how those things differ. And this attempt to sort of turn inward and really think in a concentrated fashion about the internal schisms within the black community about grief, I think was what part of what I was trying to, to contribute. So in some ways the book is in conversation uh, with uh, something like, um, Men We've Reaped um, by Jessamyn Ward. Yep. Um, you know, what does it mean to, to actually think about Black death, not in a sentimental fashion, uh, not in an activist fashion, mm -hmm. and not in a psychotherapeutic fashion, but really, again, trying to access what it feels like. And, and again, it comes back to that wave after wave after wave. No, I'm Wally Serpo. Come on, ladies and gentlemen, give it up. Wow, thank you so much. <laughs> absolutely, listen, I could have kept, we were, we were supposed to stop like seven minutes ago. No, I, no, no, thank you so right, much. Thank you, thank you so much for doing this. Um, and of course, thank you to both the bookstores that linked up to make this happen. There are links to buy the books. We deeply appreciate everyone who joined us this evening. And Namali, I hope I see you soon, but congrats. Yes. Again, Thank you so much. Such a beautiful and and truly like haunting, but like incredible book. So thank you so much. I'm gonna do it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I hope to see you again. Thank you. Absolute Good night. Pleasure. We'll see you soon.